So this topic is endocarditis. Uh, I think the title is ECHO, CT, MRI, in the theory, in keeping with the multimodality uh, concept. Um, so it's good timing. So I've given this talk exclusively a bunch of years in a row. Um, I, I pretend to talk about CT and MRI at the end. Um, but really, um, what's happened is this year, um, I was asked to redo uh, a chapter in the uh, ACSAP, the American College of Cardiology Self-Assessment Program. A lot of the fellows will know. Uh, there's a chapter in there on endocarditis. Uh, it's getting updated. ACSAP 9, it's becoming. Um, they wanted a refresh, so Dr. Chamsi Pasha uh, has worked with me on that, and he's sort of taken on updating the CT and MRI component of that chapter. So today we're going to split this. I'll give you the echo part, and then uh, Muhammad will come up and give you some of the CT MRI part as it pertains to endocarditis. So there's the slight change in the agenda. All right, so let's hope these videos work. First thing to discuss endocarditis is really to understand what is a vegetation. Uh, this is the term we use a lot. And what does it mean? So what are the features of a vegetation? So this is the TE of the mitral valve. You see this lumpy, bumpy mass here. So it has to be a mass, right? You have to visually see it on, on B-mode imaging. Uh, one of the other features is it tends to be oscillating in its motion. And what oscillating means is that it moves kind of independent of everything else. It doesn't just move in perfect synchrony with the thing it's attached to. So if it has a, additional motions, it's sort of this chaotic motion that's in addition to just the pulse, as this does. And the other thing is they tend, as long as it's a native structure, to be on the flow surface, because that's the surface that has more endothelial damage. So that's kind of the basic principle. So the flow surface on the mitral valve is the surface, that's the atrial side. The flow surface on the aortic valve is the ventricular side. So that's sort of, as you go through asking yourself, is this a vegetation? It has to be a mass, it has to be oscillating, and it should be on the flow surface. Then the next question is, well, why is there a mass there at all? And generally the principle is that there's been some endothelial damage that has allowed bacteria to set up shop. So if it's a perfectly normal looking structure, valve typically, uh, with totally laminar flow and there's a mass on it, that makes it less likely to be a vegetation because you have to have some reason to have endothelial damage. So it might be a congenital dysfunction, a bicuspid valve, something where the flow is abnormal, uh, obviously, a prosthetic valve is very abnormal, so anything prosthetic is by definition endothelial dysfunction. Um, so these are sort of the things to look at as you approach a wiggling, you know, thing. Is it a vegetation? Okay, so this one in particular, this little video, <clears throat> this is here to show you all of those features. Flow surface, oscillating, mass. All right. Um, let's see here. Yeah, what is this doing here? Hmm, don't know why this, so this one works. Next one doesn't work. I don't know why that is. Okay, well, this was another example of a tricuspid mass. There's the veggie. Don't know why that one doesn't work. Uh, this is a tricuspid valve vegetation. Similar idea. They show the flow, there's RAs on the bottom. This is a still image. Uh, and this little thing in systole is flicking back. It's pretty small but it meets those criteria. It's on the flow surface, which tends to be the atrial side. It's not an absolute rule, but by and large, it is uh, usually a good way to start, okay? So this is the kind of the idea. So this is the graphic, it just shows that the bacteria proliferate on the, the upstream or the flow surface, and usually there's some mechanism of damage, uh, whether it's, it's, you know, it's interesting, it tends not to be a ton of calcification. It's actually pretty rare to see uh, endocarditis on top of a big calcified lesion. You don't generally see it on MAC, it's actually fairly rare on degenerative calcific aortic stenosis um, because calcium by itself is not a rough, roughened endothelial surface. So calcium by itself doesn't necessarily um, portend to a lot of risk for endocarditis. Okay, and this is sort of the pathogenesis of the endocarditis. It is, as I mentioned, some sort of disruption of endothelium. You get an inflammation, you get fibrit, platelet deposition, and then this is the key, that's when the bacteria gets in there. Uh, then the bacteria grows, becomes a vegetation, and then it's a combination of more fibrin, platelet deposition, as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Eventually, it can break off with an, a thromboembolic event, or depending on the bacterial content, you get into lo local tissue destruction. Uh, and that's highly variable based on whatever the bacteria is. Um, and this is just showing that, you know, the histology of a vegetation. 
is, is not just bacteria, it's also platelets and fibrin uh, and bacteria. That's, that's really what makes up a vegetation. Okay, so, now I don't know why this one's not playing either. We, I'm logged into the, is Tyree still here? I don't know why. We're logged into this computer. I don't know why these videos aren't playing. But, okay. Well, it makes it hard to appreciate a wiggling mask. Um, uh, well, this is a question of endocarditis. It's unusual because it's sort of tomahawk thing. I don't think you're going to get them to play now either. Um, that's okay. We're, we'll, we'll emphasize more the CT part then. Um, but the, the, the one thing this is, I, I show this case is to emphasize all those rules apply generally to bacterial endocarditis. When you get into fungal endocarditis, it has its own set of rules. Um, fungal endocarditis may be very large, uh, overly large compared to anything else. It may be predominantly fungus. It may not have as much fiber and other things mixed in. Uh, it cannot, it, sometimes it doesn't oscillate. It can just be a big, thick mass without a whole lot of motion. So fungus is basically the exception to that. It does still tend to be on the flow surface, but if anything's going to break that rule, it's fungus. Um, it also tends to be fairly slow growing and massive and, and less, frankly, invasive. Um, but it, uh, it's always something to consider. And we've seen our fair share of fungal endocarditis here, so it is a consideration for sure. Oh, that's frustrating. This one doesn't work either. Okay, so maybe we just have to go out and load it. That's, let's try that then. Okay. So this is one of the things that's happened in endocarditis in the last you know, couple of decades is that with our proliferation of uh, indwelling in, in hardware, we're seeing a lot more prosthetic device endocarditis. So this is fairly typical of a pacemaker. And when you first look at this, it's very hard to know, is this thrombus uh, or is this uh, infection? Uh, is it a vegetation? So in addition to this very large, bulky thing that is adherent here, you've also got another mass that's sort of bouncing around. You see it from time to time uh, in the ventricle. Um, we often get asked uh, by clinicians, uh, you know, is it a vegetation? Is it a thrombus? What is it? Um, and there are times you just don't know. And it's important that you don't pretend to know. Um, you, you can sort of try to put the clinical scenario together. Is there a low flow? Makes thrombus more likely. Is there atrial arrhythmia, like AFib? Makes thrombus more likely. But at the end of the day, you can be wrong. Um, so thrombus and vegetation, there is no specific echocardiographic you know, histologic feature that tells you the difference. It really is putting together what's the company that this mass keeps. Stasis, think thrombus. Okay. Oops. So this was an example here of um, Staph aureus endocarditis. So they can be very large and tend to be very destructive. That was on a pacer lead. And this is just before and after, just to show you that, you know, it, it is entirely lead dependent. Another question comes up, it's typically an echo, is, is it attached to something else? Is this um, vegetation, if, you know, particularly if it's culture positive, and you decide it's a vegetation, is it attached to just the device? Is it also attached to leaflet? Is it also attached to subvalvular apparatus? Um, when you ask a surgeon who goes in and takes these things off, by and large, they're not attached in more than one spot. There tends to be a stock, and the stock tends to be on the prosthetic material. So they may appear to touch or, you know, briefly interact with other materials, but they're generally not attached at multiple different spots. Thrombus might be, but a vegetation, more often than not, has a, has a stock growth and a bunch of things it interacts with, potentially. Okay. So this is one here. Um, th this is uh, looking at the pulmonic valve. And you see, again, when we look closely in the, in the right person, and this, hopefully it projects, you can see this long, very long linear strand in the pulmonic valve. The question is, is this endocarditis? So the differential as well, is it, is it oscillating? Is it moving kind of independent to the, just the beat? I think it is at the very end. Um, is it on a flow surface? That's hard to tell. The flow surface of the pulmonic valve would be the RVOT side. It's hard to tell, in this case, what it's adherent to. Uh, obviously, if it was culture positive, that would lead you to, uh, to lean towards endocarditis. But the other thing to recognize, this is a high flow state. This is RVOT. That's pretty hard to get a thrombus just sitting in the RVOT under very high flow. And then when you get some history, you find out that this is an IV drug user. Um, and that there's also wide open uh, pulmonic insufficiency. Certainly makes endocarditis much more likely. The other subtle thing to recognize when you're trying to differentiate uh, veggie versus non-veggie 
veggies tend to be more associated with dysfunction because they're, they're locally destructive even if you haven't seen it. Uh, so if there's a lot of uh, insufficiency, as in this case, putting the context together with an ivory drug history, uh, you, you can be pretty sure this is um, endocarditis. Okay, so there's this notion of non-infectious endocarditis. This comes up. By and large, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. You've seen something and you've cultured and it's culture negative. And I'll go back to this strategy. We'll make it play here. These are kind of shy videos, but then they play. All right. So let's ask us those same questions. There's something unusual on this TE of the mitral valve. Um, first thing that's unusual, it seems to be on both leaflets. There's a little bit on the posterior leaflet and in the anterior leaflet. Uh, it's not very large. It's kind of diffuse, but it seems to involve both the atrial side and the ventricular side. So already there's some, it's a little unusual, this. Could be vegetation, a bacterial uh, infectious uh, uh, thing, but it may not be. And then if you get a little more history, well, at least in this patient, you find out that this is actually a definition of Libman Sachs endocarditis. So they tend to be these flat, they don't get very large, they don't tend to have all of that oscillation because they're just not as big, uh, and they spread very widely. Uh, and these are really associated with typically SLE lupus. Okay. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the complications of endocarditis. This is really important for us to recognize. Okay, we'll go back to this strategy for no good reason. All right, so we're looking at this TE of the mitral and aortic valves. If you look at the aortic valve, that's at the bottom of the image here, there's nothing obviously abnormal. If you look closely at the mitral valve, there's a little something funny happening up here. Um, sometimes that's just an artifact kind of coming in and out of the plane. Maybe that's some of the posterior annulus, which is normal, but it looks kind of weird. But what's clearly abnormal, if you look at the base of the posterior leaflet, there's a defect, uh, and that's when you turn color on. So even just without putting on color blindly, you look at this image and you suspect that you've got what appears to be a disruption of the post base of the posterior leaflet with a little bulb bowel thing, and maybe even some abnormality here on the underside of the leaflet. So when you put color on, you see that there's very clearly a perforation of the posterior leaflet. So now you've got a wiggling mass with a perforation uh, that is very, very likely to be infectious endocarditis. Um, very little else will give you a perforation at the base of the leaflet. So a hole in the leaflet is, by and large, they've either been instrumented and it's a, some sort of procedural misadventure, uh, or it's basically been infected. And that's the perforation shown here. And that's kind of what that looks like. And that tends to be what happened. The natural history, if you can, it's very, very difficult to get it, but these things tend to be bacterial inflammation, weakening of the tissues, and then this windsock that sort of blows up, it gets longer, and then it pops a hole in the toe. And so a lot of times when there is a perforation, it's sort of heaped up and looks like a little volcano uh, and this circumferential lesion all around the perforation. And this is, uh, again. Pardon me? The file is on the server. Okay, I'm almost done. Well, I'm not almost done, but uh, well, okay. You know what, Carlos? More often than not, you're right. So <laughs> let me see if I can grab that and drag it somewhere. In my office, it plays just as fast in both spots, but maybe not here. But the movies, that will take too long, actually. To move all the movies and everything else will take forever. Okay. We made it. We'll keep going. All right, so this is that same patient, um, just super nasty stuff. Um, so this is a, a case of uh, an aortic dissection. So this is descending thoracic aorta. Uh, this is a mycotic aneurysm, so local infection of the aortic wall uh, with vegetation. This is sort of the trifecta of badness, um, which had to have surgery. Yep. Yeah. Is vegetation because of the clinical cord that you put together? Correct. Yeah, that could be. You would, you would have to ask yourself, why, why would it adhere there? But that could be low flow if it's a false lumen. Absolutely, yep. False lumen, it could have been Yeah. This could be part of the aortic wall that has ruptured. Yeah, it's a rupture. Sure. Yeah, I mean, there's always a differential. So the clinical course makes it more likely. 
Absolutely, and that's one of the most important first questions when they get an image and you see something is, are there blood cultures? If four to four bottles are Staph aureus, yep. probably doesn't matter what you call it. Uh, the treatment's gonna be the same. Um, all right. So um, this is just an example. When these patients go to surgery, you know, depending on the bacteria, they can be locally uh, invasive and in ways that don't respect any sort of natural tissue planes. They can, they can perforate in any direction, effectively. Uh, if, particularly if there's been previous instrument, instrumentation with sort of scar and adhesions, uh, there isn't really any way to predict. And we've seen fistulas from the aortic root to the RA, aortic root to the RV, septal, anywhere. So if you, just, if you understand where the anatomy is, um, you can have funky flows anywhere. Um, and that's important when you're doing a T or transthoracic. If you see a mass, it's very important if you don't know what it is, and often you don't immediately know what it is, is to add the color and even do sweeps, because that's the way you're gonna find off-axis flow events, like perforations, that don't respect our natural transthoracic imaging patterns. Uh, so it is important to, to sort of you know, really interrogate with color, consider the sweep, get creative. You may find things that uh, are connecting chambers that really shouldn't be connected. Okay. So a few words about prosthetic valve endocarditis. Uh, we've had whole lectures on this, different, many different devices. Okay, do this. So this is a, a mass in the ascending aorta, recognized some months after a surgical aortic valve replacement. At first, it wasn't noted. Um, you know, you're sort of looking at the valves. There's a little some lumpy bumpiness here. Uh, the cultures were negative on this particular patient. He wasn't feeling well. He'd had weight loss, really wasn't doing very well after his surgical uh, valve replacement. Uh, and then you sort of look at this and say, well, this isn't just some thickening of the ascending aorta. It's oscillating. It's vibrating. It's behaving really very differently. In addition, there was also some uh, valve dysfunction here. You could argue that maybe there's, probably doesn't project well, there's a little linear strand even coming down here um, in the LVOT that's, that's uh, evident in diastole. Um, and what was this? This was a thing that doesn't really respect any of the rules. This was fungus. Uh, so this was a patient who'd had one stitch in the, ace, in the base of the aorta at the time of the surgical intervention. One little piece of stitch was hanging in the, LV, in the ascending aorta and that a big fungus ball sort of found that, gathered it, and away it went. Uh, so that was periprosthetic fungal endocarditis. Um, different case. This is four months after a surgical AVR. Um, and you see this thing, and that's not subtle. Um, now, this is interesting. So this case, I believe, is the one. Um, again, it's sort of oscillating. It's attached. Could that be thrombus? Uh, it's possible, but it's a very high flow state on the distal side of a bioprosthetic valve. That's, those are high velocities. You'd probably have to have a very uh, unusual uh, hematologic state to uh, really get a thrombus there. And this was nocardia endocarditis. So um, we don't know a lot about nocardia. They tend to grow very big. So um, it's one of the things that when you see a massive thing, that by, by now ID is involved and they have to do some special tests. But this was a case from here not so long ago. Um, this is a neat one. This is a 3DTE of somebody who's had a prior surgery. Uh, and you can see this is looking down on the mitral valve here. This is the um, appendage. The aortic valve is right here. And you get this long linear strand. It looks like sort of a water snake or something. Uh, and this definitely got somebody's attention. Uh, it was evident on the, on the 2D transthoracic. It was alarming on the 2D TE. And then it was perplexing on the 3D TE. So we see this big thing. And this is not a veggie. This is these cords from an attuned surgical ring done at another center where the surgeon didn't recognize they were supposed to take this and tie a knot. They sort of sewed it in, left it in, and, and did 95% of the surgery and left this alone. Um, and then every doc since said, what the hell is this? So that's where the history is very important. And culture negative. What's that? Yeah. It's still there. It's still there. It's not bothering anybody unless you're looking at an echo. Um, so that's the attune ring. Okay. Um, I'm going to start calling this the uh, Carlos maneuver. Get it to play. Okay. So this was an unusual case. This is somebody who had uh, culture positive uh, on a mechanical mitral valve. Uh, you can see a, a wiggling mass here, a couple of spots. This one doesn't really oscillate. It kind of 
flops in fairly rhythmically, but on this side it looks a little more oscillatory. Um, the rule of flow surface doesn't necessarily apply so well on bioprosthetics valves. This one's sort of arguably on the flow surface, um, but not, it's kind of attached to the, the frame here. Um, but so culture positive, mobile mass, uh, echo definition, this is a uh, vegetation. Um, treated, but uh, treated with antibiotics, this particular patient uh, was a very high risk for surgery. So somebody presents to the hospital with bioprosthetic valve endocarditis, uh, you know, sort of confirmed endocarditis. Um, what do we think the uh, in hospital or at least 30 day mortality is? Any guesses? 50%. It, is high as 50%, it's somewhere between 30 and 50%, but it's, it's one of the most deadly things we see is a presentation to hospital with prosthetic valve endocarditis. Uh, there's not much more that you're gonna walk into that has that much risk. And that's with or without surgery. Um, that's just, they don't do well. Uh, this guy had a very high surgical risk. This is a, so that one, this is the one. Um, this is quite different. There's a bioprosthetic a mitral valve, big chunker, lots of uh, regurgitation as well. This is the patient, you see he's got atrial fibrillation, the appendage isn't really contracting, um, was a high risk for surgery, lots of antibiotics, surgeons said no thank you, uh, didn't have another option, you do not do valve and valve procedures for these, so there's no role to sort of crush and, and, uh, uh, and try to gel the vegetation, that doesn't work, um, that just gives you an abscess eventually, and two bad valves. So this guy got anticoagulant, uh, he got, uh, yeah, there we go, ah, IV antibiotics, A very rare situation where the IV antibiotics alone were sufficient to debulk the vast majority of this lesion. Uh, the leaflets aren't quite normal. You see this one is sort of behaving a little weird. It doesn't lay down flat anymore. Um, and there's a bit of chunkiness, but the vast majority of that uh, was obstructive lesion actually melted away with antibiotics. So that's really the exception and not the rule. Uh, but even this valve didn't get away scot-free. Let's see here, let me do my Carlos. Okay, so after uh, six weeks of antibiotics, there were these three little paravalvular defects. So the, the bacteria sort of left its trace, um, but this patient miraculously did avoid a second surgery. Uh, and that's sort of an example. And see the sort of lumpy, bumpy uh, ness to this prosthetic leaflet is what happened with the endocarditis. And these are the three new defects that the bacteria created. Okay. This is a, a physician who presented to us um, with culture positive and a prior history of endocarditis. He had his mitral valve replaced because of endocarditis. That was about a year prior. And then he presents here, and if you look at the valve itself, there is, this is a mechanical uh, valve in the mitral position. Um, the leaflets appear to open and close fairly well. You don't see any large mass here. Um, any concerns with this one? There's no obvious vegetation. 11 o'clock, right. This thing that, that some may have thought was the aortic valve or something unknown, this is a massive paravalvular defect. So this is basically the crux of the heart fell apart. Um, he'd had his crux rebuilt basically with pericardium at the first surgery with clear instructions to never get infected. That was his discharge summary. Um, and it didn't work. Um, and he actually had to go to hospice because there was nothing left to rebuild. So he was not a surgical candidate. Um, but that is the size of, a, that's probably the biggest paravalvular defect I've ever seen, and that was basically eroded from his mitral valve into his aorta. Um, but culture, yeah, he was actually culture negative. He was culture negative because he'd had so many antibiotics. Um, you know, he had the first fever, he got antibiotics, and then he never was growing the culture. But by every account, that was uh, destructive endocarditis. So, um, you know, this is part of the anatomy to recognize, is the cardiac crux and the concept of the cardiac crux or the cardiac skeleton. So if you look at the four chambers and this fibrous tissue in here that really holds it all together, this is generally what acts as a natural barrier for bugs. It's difficult to get through here. Many bacteria won't get through. Staph aureus will get through. Uh, and if you look from above, these are the trigones, the sort of fibrous structures that, this is sort of the left fibrous trigone, the right fibrous trigone. This is the aortic valve here, tricuspid, mitral. And this is really the area of interest that all of this connective tissue, uh, which is very fibrous, um, can get infected and actually just destroyed randomly uh, by certain bacteria. So that's called the intervalvular fibrosa. This is it. And this is a very important area to target with imaging, whether it's TE, transthoracic, CT, MR, whatever. I mean, if you're looking at native or even um, prosthetic valve endocarditis, you've got to make sure that you've really interrogated this because this is where trouble happens. 
And this is kind of a nice depiction of the systolic flow going out the aortic valve and how it bulges forward, that base of the anterior leaflet. That bulge is very normal. That's your systolic flow hitting the aortic root and then helping to actually close the mitral valve. It pushes the anterior uh, part of the base of the uh, mitral valve forward, and that's actually what contributes to co-optation. And this is just looking from the OVOT. So all of this area here is your intervalvular fibrosa. So look at this patient. He had a bioprosthetic aortic valve two years prior. Comes in, fevers and chills, so, so that's really suspicious. Um, looking at his valve, don't see anything obvious. If you look long enough, you can often convince yourself you see a wiggler, um, but not super obvious. Um, yeah, there, there it is, yep, different view. Now you see it. That is abnormal. That's not any part of normal motion of a bioprosthetic valve. Uh, I think you can see it initially at some point it pops into the x-plane view I'm not quite seeing it now in the short but it's clearly the view right you can see it there so he actually had severe prosthetic valve stenosis so the fevers and chills uh, CW Doppler he's got a velocity in excess of four meters that was an important change from the pre-discharge uh, echocardiogram so that's not that common so to actually have endocarditis causing severe stenosis um, We've seen it a handful of times, so that's certainly not the typical presentation. The typical presentation tends to be one or more destruction and aortic insufficiency. But you can, this is an example of, there's not a lot of AI, but there is clearly severe AS. Um, so he was treated with antibiotics uh, for two months. Um, and now you don't see the mass anymore, so it seems like terrific success. This maybe is like the other case. Maybe we're going to get away without surgery. Uh, any concerns on this echo? So the intervalvular fibrosa that I was showing you here, now we have this new kind of lucency here we didn't see before. I'll take you back. Look at it here. And in retrospect, when you look back, maybe it was there. Um, it was sort of a, maybe an, maybe an early call, I'm not sure, but this is what happens. And sometimes when you're not sure, you repeat studies. And this is why you repeat studies after a time frame. It's like two weeks later, well now we got this. This was two months later. So now we've got this, that's, that's concerning. Uh, and, you know, this is the, an evolving periprosthetic abscess. And that's the classic feature. And it's contained. It hasn't opened on either end, so it's not pulsatile. Um, once it opens up, typically on the LVOT side, then it becomes pulsatile. All the pus gets washed out. They tend to have a fairly dramatic fever at that point. Um, and then it gets pulsatile. So he had to go for a redo AVR. With this. There's no medical therapy for a periaortic abscess. Um, it's a different case. This one clearly was uh, suspicious at the get-go, and that's just a nice example of sort of a, uh, a periaortic abscess. And that's that, that's that intervalvular fibrosa, the connection between aortic and mitral valves. Um, it's relatively avascular, if you can imagine such a thing in the crux of the heart, um, but that is where bacteria uh, can set up shop and really cause the most damage. Um, this one actually was so destructive uh, that it involved the antimitral leaflet. It is a periaortic abscess, and even it is sort of extended locally to create a, a ventricular abscess. So this is massive destruction um, from bacteria. And this is your classic. Was that? Oh, there we go. Come on. Sort of septated. It's not necessarily all uh, homogenous in there. Um, it's large enough that there's really no question about what that is. Everybody should recognize that that is an abscess. And these are all surgical consultations. So this is what I was talking about, pulsatility and pseudoaneurysm. So in this case, as soon as you see it pulsating, it's no longer contained, so it's no longer by definition an abscess anymore. Abscesses are contained. This is not contained if it's pulsing. Um, so then you sort of look and say, well, where's the flow going? And you add the color and there's really flow in and out. So this is how they extend. So now you've got an opening of this was an abscess, now it's a pseudoaneurysm because it has an opening at one end, it's pulsatile, so the LV pressure is being transmitted into this contained sac, and these can propagate and sort of spiral all the way up the ascending aorta. And Dr. Reardon gives a nice story of somebody he was referred to in the ER um, who was quite sick and he went down to the ER and they had a pulsating mass in their neck. And the ER doc wanted to put a needle in it, and he encouraged that they don't do that. And they did a CT, and it was a pseudoaneurysm from the root. It went all the way up to the neck. Uh, so they can, they can propagate until they run out of tissue. Um, so these can go a long way, uh, which sort of gets to what CT is useful for. We're not going to see how far that goes on echo. Um, 
And you can do uh, your pulse wave. You can see that there's uh, flow uh, in and out of this mass. Uh, and then sort of the natural history is if it pops at the other end, if it pops typically the LVOT first, then the ascending aorta, now it's a fistula because you've got an opening at both ends, so now you can just bypass the valve. So it looks like a, you know, it is basically, technically it would be PVL, but in this case it's an aortic root fistula and it broke at both ends. So the echo summary, and we'll let Muhammad come up, the echo summary is endocarditis, is inflammation of the, of the uh, endocardium. Uh, it usually involves the valves, but it can certainly involve a lot of the prosthetic material that we're putting in. Um, the prototypic lesion is the vegetation, which is more than just a bacteria. It's also uh, plated and fibrin. Um, and echo is the mainstay. Now, one thing that's come up that's interesting is, is in the TAVR world, we've put in, I don't know how many TAVRs we've done now. Yeah, we're, we're, we have well over, I think we're like 1,600 now. We've put a, an enormous amount of TAVR. Um, but the incidence of endocarditis in TAVR is certainly less. And, and I, don't have, I can't back this up by knowing what the TVT registry data say, but I think our experience is we've seen very little TAVR endocarditis compared to SAVR endocarditis. But that may be a sampling issue because the denominator part is huge. In other words, when you yeah. see APRs instead of the denominator in the country is huge. Right. So maybe it's true, but yeah. I think that more time is needed. It's an interesting, uh, well, it be, it'll become very relevant if it's true. It's hypothesis no, generating. The flow dynamics are so good that maybe that protects the valve. The flow dynamics are better, so you've got more laminar flow, but, uh, and you also don't open the chest. You don't have the chest. And you don't open the chest. So you, don't ever, you never have that OR exposure right. to the environment. Yeah. Um, it, could be, it could be true. But if, if it's true, and we start moving TAVR down into the low risk 50 and yeah. 60 year olds, if, even if you cut the incidence of endocarditis by a few important percent, then who knows? Yeah. But we'll see. It sort of meets. The observation that we see less of it goes along with the general findings of low flow, endothelial dysfunction, that kind of stuff. Okay, Mohammed, come on up here and, and regale us with the CT, MR, endocarditis comments. So good afternoon, everyone. In the next 10 to 15 minutes, just try to kind of um, shift gears from echo to cardiac CT. And I have to admit the Europeans are always one step ahead of us because as you can see in their most recent 2015 endocarditis guideline, on top of your blood cultures and your echo criteria, you actually have um, abnormal activity detected on FDG PET, so that's basically your nuclear scan, and or if you have definite paravalvular lesion detected by cardiac CT, that these are considered a major criteria, not part of the Duke, but part of the major diagnostic criteria. And um, if you look at their work working algorithm for patients that um, by the modified Duke criteria, if they have definite endocarditis, then that goes along with but in patients who have possible and or uh, you have high suspicion for endocarditis and they don't meet 
any of the major echo or blood cultures criteria, then there is actually a role for either uh, repeat imaging with TTE or TE and or uh, looking for cardiac CT and imaging for embolic events, which you can do um, with both uh, CT and PET. And also there is a big role for cardiac CT in evaluating prosthetic valve endocarditis. And by the American guidelines, cardiac CT is considered a class two level of evidence B. So where does CT help in patients with endocarditis? So mostly for complications of endocarditis. So if you have um, abscesses on the valve level or the aortic root level, pseudoaneurysms, you can also assess the extent and the consequences of any perivalvular extension. Um, you can uh, clearly delineate uh, the valvular anatomy in terms of size, calcification. You can, as Dr. Little said, also have full uh, 3D evaluation of the aorta in case of um, um, valve endocarditis. The surgeons love CT for pre-planning because it tells them uh, what they're going to go in and deal with. And then in right-sided endocarditis, it also helps to kind of evaluate for septic uh, emboli um, leading to pulmonary infarctions and or abscesses. So kind of a one-stop shop uh, in that uh, case setting. This is a young patient who actually came to us with um, um, fever post-dental procedure. And uh, we can see on TEE, he has a bicuspid aortic valve with what looks like an echo-dense um, uh, thickening of that valve. And then on color, you can actually appreciate that there is a pretty eccentric aortic regurgitation uh, jet in that patient. So if you look at the CT, now you understand that there is actually those veggies on that bicuspid aortic valve. There is all those echo um, hypodense legions on both the anterior and the posterior aortic valve leaflets. And then on top of that, you have actually have this paravalvular uh, pseudoaneurysm, which is kind of leading to free-floating communication between your LVOT and the aorta. And that's basically corresponding to your um, severe aortic regurgitation uh, in this case. Now, at the same patient also, um, if you look at the, uh, the uh, anterior mitral valve leaflet, right at that aortomitral curtain, and this is kind of a more like a zoomed in view. So you see the veggies on this aortic valve, but on top of that, there is actually this pseudoaneurysm involving the intervalvular fibrosa. And this is the still frame of the image during systole. And this one here also shows you the pseudoaneurysm right at the aortic valve level. And actually that CT finding corresponded with what the surgeons saw at the time of the surgery. So you have this AO to LV fistula, which we saw that, but also what they described is this moth-eaten aortomitral fibrous curtain. So um, you had very nice corresponding images in this case, which the patient had as part of pre-cardiac uh, surgical planning was this CT. And Gamilla, by the way, is a um, normal commensal flora that's present in the um, respiratory slash the oral tract, and very rarely that's been associated with endocarditis, usually post-dental procedure. Now, um, for mitral valve endocarditis, I guess we can appreciate in this um, CT, you have this posterior mitral annular calcification, and you have all those echo hypodense lesions that are kind of involving the anterior mitral valve leaflets. But if you take it one step further, um, you actually can appreciate that not only you have a veggie on this valve, but it almost looks like there's an abscess um, or a, I would say a pseudoaneurysm that's basically um, eroding into the LV cavity. Uh, so only relying on that valve plane, this may or may not be missed because it's mostly at the base or at the crux of the heart, as Dr. Little was saying, and you can clearly see a communication. So here we're looking at the uh, pulmonic valve. This is the right ventricle. This is the posterior mitral valve. This is the anterior mitral valve leaflet. And you can actually clearly see the um, abscess eroding into the LV, creating this crypt-like uh, uh, space. And um, with uh, CT, you basically have the whole three-dimensional uh, data set. We can see here basically the uh, MAC, and then as it's scrolling back, you can actually appreciate this cavity, which is uh, kind of indrilling into the um, left ventricle. And you can assess proximity of that thing to any uh, coronary structures slash venous structures, and that also will help decide the surgeons in terms of uh, what is the extent of this um, so the aneurysm is. I guess everyone, uh, maybe even like at the end of the hall, can appreciate that you have this large um, uh, hypodense uh, mass that's basically attached to the tricuspid valve. This is a young patient 
with uh, IV drug use and documented MSSA endocarditis. Um, so per se, we cannot tell on uh, CT whether this is a vegetation or a thrombus because both of which are going to have kind of Hounsfield units that are in the like anywhere from like 30 to 80, but I guess uh, what CT basically can help us is getting a three-dimensional um, uh, aspect of this mass, its attachment to the leaflets, and also um, whether or not there is any paravalvular extension, and that's really kind of where the strength of CT is. Um, this is a case I think Dr. Little showed where you have the pseudoaneurysm and you got this communication creating like almost a fistulous tract between the LVOT and the ascending aorta, you can see that also in any other anatomical imaging modality. So this is a cardiac MRI in a three-chamber view. So you see this bioprosthetic aortic valve, and you basically have this expanding uh, pseudoaneurysm right at the aortic um, root. This is a short-axis view of the aortic valve. So we basically see the bioprosthetic valve, and all this space is basically the expanding pseudoaneurysm at the base uh, of that um, aortic valve leaflet. This is another case, a patient with a bioprosthetic aortic valve, and what he has actually, all this echo, or I would say hypodense um, material, this is all basically abscess filling in this root. Uh, and on top of that, you basically have this large pseudoaneurysm. Basically, you can nicely see all three valve leaflets, and you have this massive pseudoaneurysm, which is practically encroaching on the left sinus of Valsalva. And, um, Again, you basically have more in-depth knowledge of how far and how significant this thing extends to, and you have also all the information you need about the extension of the abscess. Uh, this is a patient who uh, we see this um, uh, little small um, mass. It's basically at the ventricular side of the LV outflow tract, so it kind of does, does kind of go along with the vegetation. We see it here in a still frame. But on top of that also, this patient um, uh, we don't appreciate any definite masses on the mitral valve, but we can clearly see on this end systolic frame that there is no coaptation uh, of the anterior and the posterior mitral valve leaflet. And this patient actually was transferred with severe aortic regurgitation and severe mitral regurgitation. Um, and while he was at the other hospital, he was treated with antibiotics. So again, our resolution is not high enough in order to detect small vegetation. So that's very important on CT. Small vegetation, especially if they're highly mobile, we don't have the high temporal and the spatial resolution as transesophageal echo to kind of tell whether there is a vegetation or not, but at least you can basically appreciate valve anatomy uh, in this case. Um, this was a recent paper kind of um, looking at the diagnostic accuracy of TEE uh, and CT in 75 patients. Um, the detection rate of veggies on TEE was 97%, while on CT was 72%. And as we can see, that small vegetations in this study less than 10 millimeter was markedly underdiagnosed by CT, only 52%. Um, while if you look at the, um, uh, how good does each modality does in terms of diagnosing complications of endocarditis, TE was more useful than CT for valve perforations, as we understand because of the spatial resolution, and intracardiac fistula because we do not have hemodynamics on CT as we do on TEE with color Doppler, while CT was basically more better in diagnosing perivalvular uh, abscesses. Uh, two more slides about FDG PET since this will be coming um, to this institution. You got this patient with a bioprosthetic uh, mitral valve who has uh, severe eccentric mitral regurgitation. Um, and what you can appreciate on the FDG PET is basically this high signal uptake at the base of the um, mitral um, surgical frame and that's basically is abnormal. This is another patient who has a native um, mitral valve endocarditis with what looks like a vegetation at the atrial side of this valve and mitral regurg is present. And then he had basically this high FDG uptake um, present. Along with that, he also has this high FDG signal uptake in his spleen indicating splenic abscess. So with FDG PET, you also get anatomical imaging through uh, not only cardiac structures, but whether or not you have any septic emboli to other uh, structures. So um, what are the advantages of PET CT versus uh, disadvantages? So it's non-invasive. You can actually acquire images within um, a turnaround time of close to two hours. 
You have excellent spatial and contrast resolution and can allow you to precisely detect and de delineate the infected sites. Also, you can look for sources of infection elsewhere in the body um, and has been uh, established as a diagnostic modality of choice in patients with um, uh, prosthetic valve endocarditis and or patients with um, pacemakers, defibrillators, especially in the absence of uh, echo findings. Uh, some of the limitations of uh, PET-CT is not widely available. Um, and then practically that some small vegetations can uh, not cause a high FDG uptake. So you also have to bear in mind that your spatial resolution is also not super high. So anything less than four millimeter may or may not be uptaken uh, by FDG. And we're still waiting for like large scale studies to look at the clinical value uh, of it in patients with um, cardiac infections. Questions about anything? That, that circ imaging study you showed were CT versus that was, what was the reference standard? Was it circ? Uh, on this paper? Yeah. Uh, that's a yeah, but the question. TE has a 97% pickup. Yeah. Against what? Or compared to what? Yeah, I, I honestly don't remember what did they use as a gold standard uh, in this but case. They don't mention in the abstract. The yeah. I doubt this surgery because if they are small, these are the ones that. Um, I always wonder when they have these modality comparison studies without a third independent you know, reference. Yeah. How do you use 97% compared to the Duke criteria plus? Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's more clinical. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know the, the answer to that. Yeah. But the spatial resolution is because of motion. That's the yeah, issue. exactly. Spatial resolution is better than TV. Yeah, you're right. Right? So it's, it's the motion. That the mobility, yeah. Very good. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.